to the user. So in our audit, in the AA paper, we are focusing primarily on audit. So some of you may be sitting the AAA or the advanced audit on the shows, which is previously called the P7 paper later on. So in the assurance, uh, in the AAA paper, which is the last paper of ACCA study, we'll be focusing on more on the non-audit assurance engagement as well. But in the AA paper, we're going to be focusing on the audit and assurance. So audit assurance here, with regards to audits, the level of work means positive, which means lot of assurance which means the work. So we will be performing lots of work to check the client's financial statements. And finally, for the positive assurance, we can also use another name for this, is opinion. So we will have our audit opinion. And after we check the client's financial statements later on, we will say to our shareholders, the client's shareholders, of where not the client's company's financial statements are true and fair. A bit complicated, isn't it? But let's think about it in this way. So first of all, we are the member in the audit firm. So audit firm is what I mean by the qualified accountant having the practice certificate. So you can sign your name on the audit report. So first of all then, what the audit firm is going to do is to sign a contract with the client's company. The client's company can be involving in many different industries, for example, the airline businesses, the real estate businesses, or the retail businesses, and so on. Uh, so we're going to sign a contract with the client's company. The contract in the AA term is called engagement letter. So engagement letter is where we sign a contract with the client's company to provide the audit services. Remember, the audit is to check the client's financial statement. The client will generate its financial statement, or we can call it as the FS for short. So what audit firm is going to do, okay, we are the member of the audit firm, so we are called external auditor. Because we are not the employees of the client's company. And then we will do lots of work. So lots of work I'll be using the keyword is called positive assurance. We will give positive assurance to a client's shareholders. Shareholders, they are the boss of the client's company. So we'll be doing lots of work per the engagement letter. And finally, we'll give positive assurance to those shareholders in the form of audit opinion. I'm going to tell the shareholder of the, of the client's company where not the client's company's financial statements are true and fair. So the components in the financial statements will include, you may have studied that in the FR paper or the F7 financial reporting. So it includes the statement of financial position, the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, the statement of changes in equity, the statement of cash flows, and more importantly, is the disclosure note, including the accounting policies and, and accounting estimate. So what we, what we need to do from the external auditor's point of view, we would be seeing different component in the financial statement where not they are true. So in other words, where not they are prepared per the IFRS or the International Financial Reporting Standard. At the same time, we will need to see where not their financial statements are quite fair, but we are talking specifically about the accounting policy that the clients have been using in its account. So where not their accounting policies are reasonable. So for example, the client's company may be in the retail business. 
selling items of I don't know um, shampoo um, uh, bottle of water that kind of stuff and what we need to do is to see its accounting policy so for example it may decide to value its inventories using for example the weighted average method but uh, in the retail industry, it may be better for you to use the FIFO or the first in first out method as your accounting policy for inventories, for example. Now we'll be seeing whether or not their accounting policies are reasonable. So we'll do a lot of work here, okay? So um, in the AA paper, from the exams point of view, it'll be divided into the section A and section B, 30 mark, for the question a, uh, for the section A and 70 marks for the section B. Section A is the objective test questions with 15 questions in there, two marks each. I must say that section A requires lots of work. Although you, are, you may not be an auditor or you may not have audited the kinds of financial statements before, you may be a student, no worries for that, but you need to do lots of work to get these 30 marks. I would say it's quite tough, very tough for this section A, because it really requires you with a deep understanding of the ISA knowledge. So I would say you need to have a deep understanding of the international standards on auditing knowledge. And this is why the aim for these three sections, I will detail each ISA, each international standards on auditing um, to you so you can have a better understanding of the ISA before you can apply this ISA knowledge into the section A questions. I must say very tough. But the 70 mark in the AA exam is the narrative part. The narrative part, from my perspective, it would be quite easy. So why would I say that? Because the narrative questions in section B frequently came up as the questions that has already come up in the past. So you will expect some questions to be quite similar to the ones that you have already been practicing and seeing during your studies. So by studying, the past exam paper would really help. But of course, section A will be quite tough. And that's why according to our plan, so for example, uh, in the section number one, I will be covering the ISA 200 and 300 in the section two, 330 and 320, section three, 500 and 505. And at the same time, I'll be mixing with other standards on auditing as well, okay, uh, in the course, and no worries for that. Okay then, now, the first ISA I'll be covering is the ISA 200, and after each ISA, I'll be illustrating with a past exam question as well, no worries for that. But first of all then, just the background information here. Now, from the accounting's point of view, we have the IFRS. Well, in other words, it's the International Financial Reporting Standard. So the International Financial Reporting Standards are come up with by the IFRS Foundation. They are based in the UK. However, from the audit's point of view, we have got another set of standards which are ISA, or the International Standards on Auditing. And International Standards on Auditing is come up with by an organisation called IFAC. So IFAC comes from the USA in Washington DC. The IFAC stands for the International Federation of Accountants and within IFAC, one of the departments in the IFAC is the IAASB. 
so which relates primarily to the international standards on auditing. And this is why in the AA paper we are studying this and the FR paper or the FA paper or the SBR we are studying that. Okay, just the background information for your information only. Now, when I was acting auditor, I've got a handbook in the past detailing each ISA, detailing each standard on auditing. And of course, from countries to countries, the requirements will be quite different. But nowadays, we are converging, so which means we are moving towards the international standards more closely. And that's why we'll be studying the international standards today. The first ISA tonight I'll be covering is the ISA 200, is the overall objective of the independent auditor and the conduct of audits according to the ISA. So why do we need to follow the ISA? I would say to be as an auditor will be quite risky. I would say it's quite risky because if you're not doing the work properly per the standard, you will be sued because you give your opinion in the audit report on the client's financial statement. But subsequently, if your opinion is wrong and not following the standard, leading to the shareholders suffering huge amounts of losses by buying the shares at an inappropriate price. If that's the case, then of course, the shareholders will bear the losses and then subsequently sue you. And that's why if you have an audit firm, for example, you will need to buy, I will use the word you shall. So you will see this word in different standards. We shall do this. We shall do that. In other words, we must do this. We have no choice. So for example, you shall buy the insurance. Otherwise, you may be sued and you will go bust. Perhaps you will, you will compensate for, for a lot of shareholders' interests, their losses, for example. Okay, that's why we need to follow the ISA. There'll be a couple of ISA we need to study to pass the AA paper. So first of all, what would be our general? In other words, is the overall aim which means the objective of the independent auditor. So what do I mean by independent is that we can't collude with the client. Particularly, we can't collude with the finance director to cover up their fraud. We can't do that. We need to be independent. We can't depend on them. So we are the auditor, which means the external auditor and the conduct, which means we do it we perform the audits in accordance with the standards or international standards on auditing. If you like. Or we can call it the ISA. Now, for each ISA, my teaching approach will be quite different because, because I will summarize um, quite a lot of knowledge in different ISA into very easy and beautiful, I would say it's beautiful from my perspective then, at least, hopefully, beautiful diagram. And summarizing the key stuff that you need to know so you can pass the AA paper very easily because I uh, teach the AA paper as well as the AAA for very high pass rates uh, as well as the financial reporting as well as the uh, SBR papers. Now. The ISA 200 requires an auditor to know these three things. First of all, what would be your objective? What would be your aim? So in our study, I will frequently use the mnemonic, taking the first letter to summarize them, to put them all together. So it helps students to memorize, to learn the stuff more easily. I will use mnemonics for this. It's called CEO. So when I was young, I always dreamed to be a CEO. And now I realize my dream because I'm the CEO of my education firm. All right. The first C stands for the communication. So in other words, 
usually we need to talk to others. So our aim, our objective, first of all, is to communicate with those charged with governance. So what do I mean by those charged with governance is what I mean by directors of a client. We need to communicate with them. So in particular, if we find out any deficiencies or weaknesses in their internal control systems, so what we need to do is to communicate that with the directors on a timely basis. Because if this is not the case, for example, we may find out a fraudulent transaction in a client's company. The client's company may bear losses, let's say, a thousand dollars. We need to communicate this matter with the director immediately. Otherwise, if the amount of losses from a thousand to one million dollars, if that's the case, then we may be sued for the losses that the client's company uh, has suffered. So we need to communicate with the directors first of all. Second, we need to perform lots of work. So in other words, we need to obtain audit evidence. So evidence, which means we're going to document the stuff into the piece of paper. So sufficient and appropriate. In other words, sufficient is what I mean by the quantity of all the evidence and appropriate, which means the quality of all the evidence. And we will detail them later on, perhaps in, this, uh, in a section number two, section number three, uh, when we go through another ISA. And our third objective is to issue our own audit opinion. So in other words, we're going to comment on whether or not the financial statements are true and fair. So that's important there. So that's the objective. Three stuff. CEO, communication evidence and opinion. The second element in the ISO 200 that we are required to know is the requirements when we perform the audit. Again, I'm going to use my own mnemonics for this. It's called ACE. Okay, I'm going to ACE your ACCA AA paper. So in other words, I'm going to help you to achieve maximum marks in the AA paper. So that, that's what I mean by ACE. Okay, so we're going to maximum status, in other words. The first A stands for you need to follow the audit standard. So, um, I mean, that will be relevant to the client. So, in other words, for example, let me turn to my next page for the requirement there. So, for example, we have an other auditing standard such as the ISA 610 using the work of internal auditor. But what if that client's company haven't got any internal auditors at all? So if this is the case, then we are not going to consider this particular standard. So make sure that you're ready for that. There will be lots and lots of ISA available, published by IFAC, but you don't really you don't really need to apply them all to a single client. So you only need to apply the relevant standard tailored to a client that's more important. So that's what I mean by relevant, first of all. There might be a multiple choice question here. So for example, uh, we need to apply all the ISA or all the auditing standards to a client and the exam question may say true or false. So if you don't know this word, relevant, you can't tackle the section A question. So that's why I would say the section A will be quite difficult indeed. The second element of the requirements is the care. So which means you need to think about it all the time. You need to think about the client all the time. So in technical terms, we shall exercise reasonable care when obtaining evidence and to exercise professional judgment when applying the standard. So in other words, when we apply the standard, we need to use our judgment. Where not this situation, we need to apply this standard. That situation, we need to apply that standard. The third element will be the ethics part, which means the ethical considerations. Uh, in the AA paper, we are required to follow the ACCA code of ethics, 
or we can call it as the IES per code. There'll be a couple of cases that we need to follow in the ethics part. And finally, we need to maintain professional skepticism. So in other words, we need to have a questioning mind. in your head. So that's what I mean by skeptical or skepticism, if you like, but do it in a professional manner. So in terms of the professional skepticism in the ISA 200, it says we have got three elements in that. So to be professionally skeptical. First of all, you need to question the reliability of the document and conflicting information. So for example, you see the factory, for example, the useful life should have been 20 years, but management says it's 30 years. Okay, then obtaining that evidence by communicating with the management, you will need to question the reliability of that. So for example, whether or not management has an incentive to overstate the profit, given that they're going to extend the useful life of the factory, so to decrease the depreciation expenses a little bit further, so to boost up the profit in the current period. So whether or not the management has the incentive to boost up the profit okay so you need to understand that that's the first one have the questioning mind to question the reliability second be alert so in other words if you find out any frauds and errors so for example one of the frauds uh, happens frequently in the clients business would be the ghost employee it's not a real ghost really but uh, the employee may keep getting paid even when he or she leaves the client. So he or she is not the employee any longer working for the client, but he or she gets paid. So if that's the case then, I would say that's the ghost employee. So usually the bank detail of that ghost employee would be the same as the bank detail provided by one of the managers working currently inside the business. So when the ghost employee gets paid, essentially that employee is getting payment directly or stealing fund from that company directly. So we need to be alert to that situation. I would say that if we find out the fraudulent transaction committed by the client's company, we bear the secondary responsibility for that. So what do I mean by secondary responsibility is opposing to the primary responsibility. So if the client's company has got some fraudulent transaction in the first place, the client's company suffers huge amounts of losses and the board of directors will be sued probably by the shareholders but at the same time the auditors may be sued together. If this is the case then the court may decide later on we bear secondary responsibility and not paying the full amount but the, but the majority of the losses the board of directors will be suffering or will be reimbursing to the shareholders. So we need to be alert of any particular fraudulent transactions later on that may affect the client's company's financial statement. Third one, we need to assess any room. Yeah, it's your, one of your favorites. If you studied the AA before, it's the risk of material misstatement, or you can call it as room. That's very important is the risk, risk, which means chances, opportunities, in other words, are there any chances that there might be a misstatement, so for example, not 
following the iVoice when you are preparing your account in a material manner. So in other words, it's vital. So that's what I mean by material. So risk of material misstatements, there might be chances that you are not following the standard when you are preparing your financial statement. If that misstatement or error took place, it would have a vital effect on your financial statements. That's what I mean by room. There'll be lots of rooms, okay, risk of material misstatements when we assess the client's company's financial statements. So for example, if we are checking the client's company, if the client is in the retail industry. So if that's the case then, their inventories may account for significant amounts of balances in the statement of financial position. And it may be very likely that inventories balances may be misstated in some way. So for example, not applying the correct requirements in the accounting standard in some way. And that to us, to external auditors, these are room risk of material misstatements. In other words, inventory balances may go wrong. Okay then, so professional skepticism, question in mind, alert to fraud and errors, and consider the room. Now, it's more important we put them into practice, okay? It's more important we put them into practice. But first of all, I would like to interact with you, okay? I would like to interact with you. I'm going to use Chinese. I'm going to use Mandarin. Okay. 那么现在呢，我们到达互动环节。OK， 互动环节只有我们中国学生有哈。互动环节。那么这个问题是，那么现在呢，呃，因为我们这个互动的话呢，那么只会挑选。啊，第一个回答的同学 ，OK， 而且回答正确的同学 ，OK。那么，呃，现在我抛出一个问题出来，那么看一下第二题，你觉得是 OK 还是不 OK？ 所以我们看哈。哦。我们给两个名额好吗？好，没问题 ，OK。好，没问题，那就两个名额 ，OK。哈哈。All public， 呃、uh,。Interest entities shall be applied for all ISA when they are audited. public interest entities, 呃, 他们呢, 在被审计的时候呢, A, 还有B, okay? 啊, A, true, B, false, okay? 那么呢, 那, 现在大, 大家想一下答案, 然后再打, 那么呢，我们呢准备开始哈。那么到三二一，我们就开始，然后可以打到屏幕哈。准备三二一，那么你们答案是OK。OK，好。Yeah,大家回答都非常的不错哈。那么我们今天的幸运儿呢,首先是Victoria,然后是,我看一下哈,第二个同学是,呃,因为我没读错的话,应该是Arlo,Arlo同学,OK。那么前两位同学呢,
，因为刚才我们说过，在 isotope 这里呢，有一个词呢叫 relevant 相关的 ，OK， 相关的，所以这是为什么呢？呃，我们呢是不需要用到所有的 i s o t o p e y e a h o k i 呃，伊凡，那我们幸运儿同学呢，就前两位同学 ，Victoria and Alo。OK then， now let's see。An exam standard question of taking this from the June twenty twenty one. The company is called Corley Appliances Company, and in the requirement, two marks here. First of all, you're going to define the term professional skepticism. That's the first requirement, and explain one example from audit where we should apply. Professional skepticism. Okay, two requirements. So in the exam, I will deem one mark, one point. So in other words, we will need a sentence for one mark. Right. Being professionally skeptical, I would say, for example, in our written part, which means the section B. First of all, I would like to use the subheading. As the professional skepticism, I will bold it, bold the title, and underline this. Okay, to make sure that it looks very beautiful. So, how can I explain? How can I define professional skepticism? So, to conduct the audit. We as external auditor shall, which means we must do it, questions the reliability of the document and any conflicting information. Right. That's how I define professional skepticism. We need to have a questioning mind. You don't really need to bring all this point together because I I said before. Professional skepticism includes three things: with a questioning mind, be alert to fraud, and room. But we are given one mark here, so only one sentence will be enough. So very easily, we can obtain one mark. You can use your own sentence, your own language, to write out this answer. You don't need to learn this. Second, one example. Now, let's see the case first of all. You are the audit supervisor. Okay, that's great. You are not the audit junior any longer, and you're in the process of planning the audit of the Coley Company. It's the company sells domestic electron、uh, electrical appliances such as fridge freezers, TVs, washing machines. Okay, seems that. You are the retailer. You are buying these at a low price and to sell them at a higher price. Now, note with the finance director, you are communicating with the finance director. It's one of the,、uh, I mean, the objective of auditors in ISO two hundred regarding fraud. Let's see that during the year a fraud was discovered, or in other words, is uncovered in the finance department. Oh. A payables ledger supervisor diverted fund, which means transfer the money from the company's bank account using a fake, or we can call it a fictitious supplier on the payables ledger. So, in other words, the manager is stealing fund from the client's company. The employee was immediately sacked, or we can call it as dismissed, and the value of fraud will be recognised as the expense in the P&O. Okay, no problem for that whatsoever. But how can you apply professional scepticism in this particular case? I would say, first of all, in my answer for the application part, I would take the case information. So usually, my exam technique. Will be the copy and paste approach, and then I will say to the examiner, per the ISA, per the standard, what shall we do? And then we will detail how to do it. So for a single point here, 
I'll be applying the three-step approach. First of all, during the year, a fraud was uncovered. So in other words, I simply copy and paste this sentence from the case as the step number one, because this will be the computer-based exam. Per the standard, we shall maintain professional skepticism to look for fraud which may cause material misstatements in a client's financial statement. That's per the standard ISA 200. You don't really need to quote the number. Not required to quote ISA 200 in your answer. And then as a step number three, you will need to detail how to do it. So I will use my own powerful word, for example, I will look for any fraud relating to the management override of controls, especially if this exists in the family companies. Without any signatures, they can sell anything to anyone, overriding the control. They are not following their own control procedures, leading to fraud happened in the business. So what we need to do is to be alert to those situations. For example, okay, so be specific, that's important. So um, how many marks that you've got there? One mark. So total would be two marks for this question. Simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, the second ISA I intend to cover tonight is the ISA 300. Is where we plan the audit. When we plan the audit, we need to know these four elements in the ISO 300. One, two, three, and four. Okay. First of all, you need to involve key engagement team members to have a meeting. So what do I mean by engagement? As I already said, is the audit contract. So the member responsible for this particular project, for this particular audit contract, that would be the engagement team members. That may include the audit partner, audit manager, supervisor, and also juniors. So what we need to do, they need to meet together and to document this and to focus on the highly risky areas to make sure the audit meets the deadline so probably the client's company may go listed onto the stock exchange. Have a tight deadline, you have to meet with that. So you can allocate resources, for example, the timing resource, the human resources appropriately, and to review the work properly. But you need to plan in advance. So review is to check our own work. So I'll detail that later on, no worries for that. The second element in the ISO 300 when you plan the audit is that you need to consider the preliminary engagement activities. So preliminary is what I mean by initial. Initial engagement, which means the audit contract. So what sort of things that need to be done? And this is what I mean by activities. First of all, we need to conduct the activities before the audit starts and this is mandatory and what do i mean by mandatory which means shall we shall do this with no other choices we have to do it so what sort of planning activities are there first of all we need to check the client's background so for example the ownership structure and the industry that clients is working in and in the exam question, the client's background would be always given by the examiner. We need to consider whether or not we are ethical in doing the job and solve risks involved. And we also need to consider other considerations. In particular, we'll be considering the audit strategy. So let's detail that for the planning activities for the audit strategy as well as the detailed audit plan. 
And this will be very, very important from the AA exam's point of view because the examiner is keen to examine the definition or to define all the strategy as well as the detail of the plan. You need to tell the examiner what are they. So think about it in this way. If you're going to check the client's company, if the client's company, let's say, is involved in the retail business, for example, it's a supermarket. First of all, if I were you, I would like to think about it in this way. I would need to allocate a Pope staff that has experience in checking the supermarket's final statements before. So perfectly, if any staff with supermarket working experience would be the best to be assigned to this team, to audit the client's company. And that's what I mean by the strategy. And then I will set out the detail or the plan. So within the supermarket, inside the client's company, I can see there'll be lots of products that may be easily become, becoming obsolescent. So for example, the milk uh, and the meat, yes, they quite often discount those products at the end of the day. And that's why the measurement for the inventories will need to be more careful. So we need to develop a tailored or the plan to make sure that these can be done properly. And that's why in the ISO 300, first of all, we have the audit strategy. Remember, I'm going to use my own mnemonics for this, is that audit strategy includes the STRD. So STRD, okay. Which means it includes the scope of your audit, the timing of the audit, and the resources we're going to allocate to the audit and the overall direction of your audit. And then I would like to give examples of what each element stands for. So for example, the scope of the audit. I've taken this from my working experience when I was an auditor before. For example, the scope of the audit work, which means what our audit work it includes. First of all, accounting standards that clients is going to apply, I advise. The auditing standard as the auditor will be applying will be the ISA. And some companies, for the clients' companies, they may be listed in the EU. They may need to disclose the human rights information as well. And also what, the, what are their components, including their parent and subsidiaries, and other information to be read, for example, the internal auditors report or internal controls if the client's company has got internal auditors working to improve their internal control systems. And we also need to consider other stuff. So for example, we should be at presence to the inventory count. And this is required by the ISA. Very, very important. Okay, now this is the scope of the audit work. The second element will be the timing of the audit work. So in other words, we will be considering before the year end, for example, the client's financial statement, year end, maybe 31st May. And then before the year end, we may need to perform the interim audit to set out the audit strategy. Okay. And what we need to do during the interim audit stage, which means before the financial statement year end, we need to plan these stuff. So for example, set up the audit strategy, determining the timing, when to communicate with others. And during the final audit stage, so in other words, when actual audit starts, usually after the client's financial statement year end, we will need to perform tests. So we need to determine that timing. Very important there. The third element will be the resources to be allocated. So for example, in the engagement team, it includes the following members. The partner, manager, senior, juniors, their name and responsibilities as well. And finally, the direction of the audit work. This is particularly important from the exam's point of view. First of all, we need to determine the overall materiality. So we will detail that in a later section, no worries for that. 
So materiality in today's section, which means the importance. So if that misstatement took place in the client's financial statements, what we need to do is to see their impact on the financial statements later on, which means the materiality, in other words. Second, we need to consider the risk of material misstatements or the room. There'll be different components in there. I will leave it to the next standard. And then we'll be deciding our audio approach. For example, whether or not we're gonna focus on the controls in the client's company, or we're gonna focus on the numbers. There'll be quite a lot of considerations in that. So for example, one of the control procedures of a client's company would be to set a credit limit for its credit customers before credit is granted to the credit customers at a maximum of $1 million. So what we need to do is to observe this process or to obtain the signature when approving the credit offer to a new client. So if I subsequently find out that a client uh, may be granted with a credit for more than $1 million, it means that this control procedure is not followed properly. If this procedure is not followed properly, later on, I will focus more on numbers and to checking the contract as well as the corresponding invoices to see how much value of the sales revenue or the receivables may have been overstated in some way. There might be a hidden risk that there might be uh, the irrecoverable debt expense not being recognized by a client's company. Now, after determining the STRD, the scope, timing, resources, and direction of the audit, what we need to do then is to determine the detailed audit plan. So there are two detailed audit plans here. First of all, is the pre-designed audit plans, including questionnaires, so for example, whether or not this has been done or not, and checklists that we need to sign off before we complete the final audit later on. I will de develop the tailored audit plans as well for a client. That's very important. So um, now, there'll be a couple of things here. I can send this document to you. No worries for that. I, I, I can send this PDF document to you. No worries for that whatsoever then. Okay, now let's apply the ISO 300 into a very practical and very good exam question here. I've taken the multiple choice question from the March 2016 here. Now, let's see that. Okay, now, which of the following should be included in the overall audit strategy document? So it needs to include STRD, the scope of the audit, the timing of the audit, when to start and when to finish, and the resources, especially for the human resources, we're gonna to allocate to this engagement team, and the overall direction of your audit. So for example, we'll be uh, focusing on the room, we'll be focusing on the materiality, we'll be focusing on the approach of your audit. If you know this, you will find this question relatively easy to be tackled. Okay, now. Okay, let's see the requirement. Uh, let's see the option first of all. Number one, the economic factors and industry conditions affecting the company. Do we need to consider that? Well, the answer is certainly yes because that would determine the scope of our audit work. I mean, if the economy is not very good, it may be likely that the client's company may try to overstate its profit in some way to secure the finance from the creditors. And that's why it will certainly affect the scope of our audit. Yes, number one. Number two then, the nature, timing and extent of audit procedures. Oh. Timing, right. But it's of the audit procedures, which means it's the detailed plan. So remember, during our planning stage, we need to have the audit strategy as well as the detailed audit plan. So number two is talking about the detailed plan rather than the overall strategy. So number two, no. Number three then, 
the management responsibility for financial statements. Of course, management is responsible for preparing the financial statements, and of course, this will be the precondition that needs to be met. So in other words, it's in the engagement letter. It's in the audit contract that we signed with the client's company. Uh, I mean, they are responsible for preparing the account. We are responsible for checking them. And finally, determine the materiality. Yes, because materiality, we need to determine that as the direction of your audit. And therefore, number four can be chosen. So the correct answer would be C. So that would be a typical section A question multiple choice and make sure that you're ready for that. So, in today's section that we've covered two particular standards, ISA 200, ISA 300, and I hope you will find them very useful. 那么在最后呢,我们的FBAR的这一节课呢也差不多结束了。那么最后一个呢,我们有一个bonus material. 那么bonus material是可以发给大家的。那包括我们今天对这个ISA 200还有ISA 300号的一个总结了。那么在这里呢,这个总结的话呢,是我自己写的一个note,然后呢,是非常适用于考试的,有不同的summary啦,然后apply to the case,然后把其他的ISA都融合在一起,非常的colorful,而且非常的有趣哈。那么第二个呢,也包含了这个我对过去真题的一个答案重新编写。因为我发现了有一些考官的答案呢那么大家是可以在问卷网上填写你的信息那么我们的工作人员会在很快应该在今晚就会把这个bonus material 那么Steve Number 对所以如果大家有任何问题其实也可以通过中文的方式在聊天框里面输入的那么同时因为现在也到八点的时间了如果大家对于 两名名额，那么现在开始抽奖。那么请大家离题一下。我们大概会有三十秒的时间。Steve现在可以先稍稍微先歇一下。好，那么我倒数一下最后的五秒。<笑> 5,4,3,2,1 
那么中奖的名单，我稍后在公在公布在聊天框里面，请中奖的两位同学待会儿填写我们的一个问卷，稍后的话可以给你寄送一个礼物，好吗？那么呃，现在呢，应该进入到直播间里面的有 S B R 的小伙伴，那么欢迎我们今天晚上来参加呃 A C C 公益课堂 S B R 系列的一个课程。那么今天晚上呢，呃，刚刚大家应该也有在 A 课程。的尾声，然后看到 Steve 的一些呃那课程的分享了。那我这边呢是今天给大家做做一个小小小开场白的一个，我叫呃 ACC 来自 ACC 华南市场发展教育的同事，我叫伊法。那么今天呢 ，Steve 呢他是呃我们再次邀请他来做客，成为我们今天的一个主讲的嘉宾。那其实 Steve 呢在呃过去的一年的时间跟我们的一个合作。还是很多的，呃，包括我们在前期做的一个关于他的一个呃，每期呃一个小财务知识的一个推文的分享。那么这个推文里面呢，是呃之前做的八期内容的一个合集，欢迎大家截图的保存以及课后的一个内容的一个学习吧。那么呃，在接下来 S B R 的科目里面呢。呃，我相信大家呃一定会有蛮多的收获的。那包括之前我们也听到说有准会员的反馈，呃，就 Steve 的呃之前给到同学们的压力都非常可呢，包括听他的课很多都是一次通过的。那么希望大家今天能够带着期待来学习。那么同时呢，我们也会有呃就是更多的交流，好吗？那么呃，我看到同学们后面也有陆续在提问了，呃。Steve， 您那边应该也看到吧？有回放吗？呃，这个应该能设置回放吧 ，Steve。Yeah， sure， yeah， 可以，可以，没问题。嗯，好的，谢谢。Yeah. 那么，呃，还有阿鲁的这个同学，建议 AA 单独考还是组合考？这个问题还是交给你吧 ，Steve。Yeah， 呃、uh...。<笑> OK， 呃，阿鲁问题也是非常好的一个问题，因为 A 本身呢，它是一个文字的一个科目，那么它和其他很多的科目它都会有重合的，比如说像和 I f a s t 的科目，比如说如果要组合考的，我是比较建议，比如说像和 F 七呃考一起考的话也可以。那么同时，呃，在 AA 里边呢，里边有呃那个 analytical procedure， 也就是分析性程序，那么需要计算到很多的比率。那么在这时候结合 F 九，也就是 financial management FM 这门课来考的话，其实也是可以，主要看你的时间。呃，如果我建议我的学生的话，如果一天能够花大概三到四个小时的话，考两门，我觉得呃在两个月准备的话，呃其实问题不大。但是如果呢，一呃要看你的时间，如果一天的话呢，大概只有一个小时时间的话，我建议还是单独考会比较好一点。嗯，好的，对，嗯，对，那我我也继续说一下那个，呃，在待会儿呢 ，Steve 也会跟大家互动，以及说我们也在最后会再有一轮的幸运抽奖。好，那事不宜迟，再次邀请 Steve。Okay, thank you, Eva. Okay, let's get started with the ACCA SBR or Strategic Business Reporting uh, for the international version. And my name is Steve Chen, the full fellow member of ACCA. I'm also the presenter of IFR16 on the ACCA global website and an author for four accounting books specializing in IFIS. I'll be using English tonight for two reasons. First of all, some of you may be coming from other parts of the countries, not from China. And the second reason is when we step into the professional level of our study, uh, if you're using English to study your SBR, it may better improve your performance in terms of your writing later on. Now, according to our live section plan, so for example, uh, the SBR plan, the first and the third section, I'll be using English, but for the second section, I'll be using Mandarin, okay? Uh, we'll be covering quite a few IFIs, or you can call it IAS, or International Accounting Standard. So for example, first section tonight, I'll be covering two IAS from the SBR's point of view. 
in tangible bar set, as well as the impairment of bar set. And also some of the exam techniques I'll be going through the SBR question later on. Quite interesting and challenging. Uh, I must say that the SBI exam, very, very interesting. The SBI exam is led by the SBR examining team, led by Graham Holt. Uh, he has his own style of examining the SBR paper by designing quite a lot of practical and interesting case studies. And what we need to do in the past, not right now, but in the past, we focus on the technical part in each of the IFIs, in each of the accounting standards. But nowadays, when we come to the SBI exam, it's more like that the SBI exam questions will not be heavily testing you about the complicated part in the IFIs, but you need to have a broad and general understanding of the IFIs and the interrelationship with other accounting standards as well. So for example, if I'm talking about the IAS number 36, impairment of asset, you need to understand the IFIS number 13, fair value measurement of how we determine the fair value. So that's very important there. So in tonight's section, I usually teach the SBR using this approach. First of all, I will summarize the key elements in the, each of the IFIs, and then I'm going to quickly go through the case study, which means the past exam question applicable to this particular standard. Now, first of all, I'll be covering the first accounting standards, which is the IAS number 36, impairment of asset. So impairment, which means the asset value goes down. So impairment means the value goes down. Does this standard apply to inventories? No, because the asset here, we are talking about specifically only to the non-current asset in a statement of financial positions. Uh, which means the assets for more than one year rather than inventories. Remember, inventories impairment need to be done according to the IAS number two inventories. To pass the SBI exam, from my experience, you need to have a deep understanding of each IFI's requirements. You can't mix them up all together. But in the past, when I taught the SBR previously, it's called the P2 Corporate Reporting Exam. I've been teaching the P2 for more than 10 years, as well as the AA and the AAA paper. Uh, in the past, I would like to teach my students, first of all, for the consolidated financial statements. You need to best prepare yourself with a consolidated account by practicing lots and lots of past examination questions. But for the accounting standards part, you can mix them up and to pass the exam. But in the past, of course, the current issues would be separately tested as the question number four, usually as an optional question. You don't have to choose that. But nowadays, there will be no optional questions. All questions in the exam, four questions in, in, in the SBI exam, you need to attempt them all okay before you can pass this paper and nowadays the examiner will not heavily focus on the very complicated part but the general understanding of the IFIs and the interrelationship with other IFIs will be the key to pass this paper okay now in terms of the impairment of asset first of all I would like to cover these two areas applicable to the SBI exam. And of course, in my actual course, I would like to cover five aspects in the ICE number 36, but these two aspects are commonly tested in the SBR questions. Later on, we will see an example for that. No worries for this. First of all, we need to know the rule of the impairment. The rule of the impairment is where we're gonna compare 
the net book value of the non-current asset with the recoverable amount. So after we look at the rules, and then we would like to determine the impairment review test in much more detail. By determining, first of all, the value in use and the fair value less cost of disposal. So the higher of these two, of course, later on, I will see that, later on, talk about that, is the recoverable amount. Okay, let's see a general rule for this. So for example, if you have a piece of equipment, for example, you've bought or you acquired, we use the word acquired, for the higher value asset, we acquired a piece of equipment in the past and the carrying value of that equipment is $100. But what if I use that equipment, for example, initially, I would expect that equipment to generate $1,000 of cash flows but actually, it turns out that the equipment only generates $800 of cash flows. So if that's the case, then I would say that the equipment is not working as we expect it to be. So in other words, this would be an impairment indicator. So what we need to do is to conduct the impairment review tests and to test that where not the asset value has actually gone down. So what we need to do is we're going to compare the current value, first of all, with the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount simply means to recover the cost of the non-current asset, that's very important. Because according to the conceptual framework requirement, for example, when we measure each element in the financial statement, most likely we'll be using the historical cost method. So in other words, we're gonna be recording the transaction based on the amounts that we paid according to the invoice value, and that will be a cost for the business and how we can recover that cost. So in other words, we bought the equipment, but buying the equipment later on, we'll be using that to produce items and to be sold to other customers and to determine the value of that equipment later on of how we recover the initial costs, we will be seeing if I were to use that equipment on a continuous basis in the longer term, and that would be the value in use. The value in use, in other words, will be calculating the present value. The present value of utilizing that equipment to generate into cash flows. So for example, I would expect if I were to use that equipment on a continuous basis, I may generate, let's say, $70 of cash. But if I were to sell it, if I were to sell it, I would need to determine what would be the active market price, or you can call it as the fair value, and to sell this item of equipment, we may need to incur additional costs. So for example, the commission fee that we need to pay to our third party agency company who helps us to complete the sale. Let's say the fair value less cost of disposal is only $65. So if that's the case then, if I were you, if I were to use it, I can earn more. And of course, I would decide to use it. So in other words, the recoverable amount, I would like to choose the higher of these two. And that's particularly rational, yeah? It's quite rational for decision makers 
because if I were to use it, I can generate $5 more of cash flows compared to the option if I were to sell it to a customer. So if that's the case then, the recoverable amount would certainly be $70 here. And then, as you can see, according to the rule, because the carrying value is $30 more than its recoverable amount, and that $30 more would be impairment. So the impairment loss that we're going to recognize would be $30 here. The reason why this would be a case is because, according to the invoice value, perhaps if no depreciation is charged during the year for the piece of equipment, the current value is $100, which means our cost is $100. But we can only recover that $70 out from the $100 of cost, and therefore leaving the impairment expense being $30. So for the $30 impairment expense, from the SBI exams point of view, we would like to debit the PL, which means the impairment loss expense, and depending on the accounting policy chosen by the business. Some businesses may decide to put the impairment expense into the administrative overhead right under the gross profit. But some businesses may present the impairment loss expense as an element inside the cost of sales figures before the gross profit. It really depends on which companies that you're working for, and that's particularly important there. Of course, we'll be crediting the PPE. So usually in the SBI exam will be at the carrying value. So you're gonna write down the carrying value of the PPE by $30 here. And of course, in practice, we don't usually do this. For a PPE, we will credit the PPE at cost and to debit accumulated depreciation instead. Of course, if you don't know about the term for PPE, it's been covered in the IAS number 16. It's related to property, which means your land and building, plant, which means your factory, and equipment. So equipment, which means your manufacturing equipment or your computer and so on. So they are called PPE. That's very important there. So that's the general rule. That rule is called impairment review test. So if you know this stuff, you're halfway through to this particular standard. Now, first of all then, let's detail the recoverable amount. In much more detail. The recoverable amount we should choose the higher of these two is the value in use and the fair value less cost of disposal. Very important concept here. So to, to determine the value in use, we would like to discount uh, when we utilize that asset on a continuous basis inside our business, we'll discount those future cash flows into today's terms. So in other words, to calculate the present uh, to calculate the value in use involving the present value method, which means according to the IFAS number 13, which is the fair value measurement. One of the valuation techniques that we'll be using will be the present value. The present value is where we're going to discount the future cash flows into today's terms. So in other words, we'll be using the cash flows as the numerator and to divide through by one plus the discount rate for the power of n for the number of periods in the denominator. So what we need to do is to think about, first of all, what cash flows includes and what discount rates should be regulated by the standard. I will detail the value in use here, first of all. So value in use, usually in the standards, 
is short for VIU. First of all, I would like to talk about the cash flows in the numerator. The cash flows in the numerator, first of all, it will need to include the following cash flows. It will first of all include the necessary cash flows. So what do I mean by necessary cash flows would be the cash flows already incurred in the past and we may expect a similar pattern that cash flows would occur in the future. And of course, it would include the inflows and it would include the costs as well. The costs usually would be covering the day-to-day -day costs. So for example, we have already signed a contract to rent a warehouse and to pay, let's say, $50,000 of cash in each and every year. And that $50,000 of cash is agreed in the contract and that's what I mean by necessary cash flows and we need to include that in the cash flows calculation in the VIU. Second, you've got an option here for the inflation. So of course, you can include the inflation when you're estimating the future cash flows, for example, the cash inflows in the second year. But if you decide to include the inflation in the value in use calculation, and that will be your accounting policy, you must apply this on a consistent basis in subsequent period. And of course, if you decide not to include the inflation in your cash flows calculations, of course, on a subsequent period basis, you don't really need to include that inflation again in your subsequent financial statement. And of course, for the scrap value, which means the discounted price, they're going to dispose of your piece of equipment at the end of its use for life, you will need to include that in your VIU cash flows calculation here. But of course, there will be certain elements that will not be uh, allowed from the eyes number 36 point of view. A certain cash flows need to be excluded. That's very important there. The first cash flows would be the not obligated cash flows. So a very common example in your exam would be the training costs and the research and development fees. And of course, these costs are not obligated. The company, the client's company, can in incur these costs, but they don't really have to. They are not committed. In other words, it is not what they must do. Second, we cannot include tax in our calculation because the future tax law may change. Third, we can't include our financing activities, cash flows, in the VIU calculation. That's particularly important. You can't say, I will estimate in five years' time, our company will get a significant bank loan from the bank of $1 million. So I'm going to include that specifically for this particular equipment. You can't say that, okay? Because the future financing activities is not a must-do option for the business, okay? The business can decide to go list it or the business can decide to get a bank loan from the bank. That's very important though. So let's say if I were to calculate the cash flows to be $1,000, I'm going to include that in the, numer uh, in the numerator. And then I will need to decide that what discount rate I should be used. I should be using in the eyes number 36 for discount rate. The first requirement, you can't include any tax for that. You can't say that the discount rate is 10% and we times by one minus the tax rate. We can't do that because it should be done on a pre-tax basis. Second, you can use the incremental borrowing rate.
So in other words, if I were to have this value of the piece of equipment being, let's say, $1,000, if I were to buy it, I want to get a loan from buying it, I would go to the bank and the bank would quote a specific uh, borrowing rate for you. And you can use that specific borrowing rate in your denominator calculation. Alternatively, you've got an option here, you can use the WAC or the weighted average cost of capital. Yes, this is what you've covered or you studied in your financial management paper or the FM or the AFM paper. You can use that, okay? It's your accounting policy. So let's say I will determine the discount rate will be 10% for power of five years, and then I can determine my value in use figure. Simple as that. Now, finally, I would also like to look at the fair value less cost of disposal. Very important for that. It will be regulated according to the IFAS 13 fair value measurement. For a fair value measurement, of course, we can have different valuation technique. For example, the market approach, income approach, cost approach. And then we would like to look at different inputs. Level 1 inputs, level 2 inputs and level 3 inputs. And of course, usually for the uh, piece of equipment, we would like to use the level 3 input for the estimated cash flows and so on. But I will later on, perhaps in the future, when we have time to cover this IFAS 13, but not in today's webinar. Okay then, for the um, impairment of asset, very importantly, before you conduct the impairment review test, which means to compare the current value of the non-current asset with their recoverable amount, you need to determine the impairment indicator. And that's why this is the final area in this standard, is the impairment indicator. That's very, very commonly tested by your examiner. We can divide in impairment indicators into internal indicators, which means happened inside the business, or the external impairment indicators, which means happening outside the business. So for example, if the piece of equipment is subject to physical damage, which means damaged by somebody else, or the piece of equipment is put into idle use. We are not using it right now, but we will use that later on, which means idle. Or perhaps the cash flows are worse than expected. So in other words, we would expect to use this asset and to generate $100 of cash, but actually it turns out they only generate $80 cash. And therefore, the actual cash flow is worse than what we expect before. And this will be the internal impairment indicator, the trigger, which means leading to the impairment review tests that should be done by the company. And what will be the external impairment indicators? For example, the change in macro environment. So this is particularly common in certain industries. So for example, here in mainland China, we've got a government authority and regulating quite a lot of things. For example, you can see the price of the commodity, for example, the mine, uh, is rising all the time, rising up all the time. And the government agency came in and to talk to those companies and asking them to reduce the prices a little bit further. So if this is the case, then that would be an impairment indicator, okay? And we will see a case later on. Right, of course, changing the macro environment would constantly be tested by the examiner, let's say the increase in interest rates, and that would trigger the impairment review test to be done by the client's company as well. Okay, so that's all we have of the ICE number 36, and of course, there will be other elements in the ICE number 36, for example, how to determine the cash generating units, 
how we're going to determine the disposal cost treatments when we combine with the fair value minus cost of disposal, how we're going to treat the impairment reversal as well. So those are quite technical. The examiner, of course, when examining the ICE number 36, of course, will focus on the basis, but referring to, to other standards as well. But before we leave this topic, leave the ICE number 36, I would like to interrupt with you. 那么下面我们用中文的话因为今天晚上是有一个抽奖的环节了那么在我们在看真题之前呢我们先出一个题目然后看一下大家的反应是怎么样然后我们今天 if the current value 那先不要回答哈 因为我们要看时间 of the equipment is a hundred dollars the recoverable amount recoverable amount 也是说可赎回金额的意思 那么这个机器账面价值是一百 可赎回金额的 is a hundred and twenty 然后现在我们的问题是 它的 impairment loss 也就是那减值损失多少先不要回答大家现在还不算的等我说开始再回答现在回答都不算然后A 答对的可以获得ACC的奖品 大家可以开始回答那为什么呢因为这个设备它的那个账面价值是一百但它可以收回一百二十的金额所以它根本是没有减值的因为刚才我们说到如果它的账面价值是大于可收回价值的时候它才会有减值那如果是小于可收回金额的它是没有减值所
So let's say the question requirement A marks for this. So possibly I will allocate three sentences for the step number one. For the step number two then, will be applying to the case. For step number three then, I'll be giving my own conclusion for that. Of course, I will use one sentence possibly, perhaps sometimes I'll plot another sentence by referring to the conceptual framework requirement. And therefore, I'll present four points related to step number four, when we apply the knowledge to the case. If any requirement less than five marks, let's say in this particular requirement, four marks here. Again, I'll be applying the three steps approach. But here, I may only allocate one mark in the general i files. And I will heavily place my point in the step number two, for example, two other points to get these three marks in total. And finally, one mark for the step number three for a conclusion part. I follow this approach and it really works, really. Okay, now let's see that. On 1st December 2006, field purchase and open cast coal mine, Lu Tian Kuang, uh, Lu Tian Mei Kuang, huh, in the UK. It also acquired equipment to construct various mines throughout the UK. Okay, we've got the equipment, we've got the mine, and these are non current assets. So the IAS number 36 impairment applies. However, during the last six months, there's been a significant de decline in the spot price of the coal. Okay. So a spot price is what I mean by the current market price. Because in the SBI exam, you are required to know the financial instrument knowledge. And that's why it's very important that you bear that in mind. Expecting that future reductions in selling prices may occur. Okay. Now, my, I'm, I'm sorry, coal would be an example of commodity. commodity. And therefore, we will keep an eye on to its current market prices fluctuations quite a lot. Now, let's see the next paragraph. Currently, the forward contract being signed. Okay, forward contract is what I mean by the financial instrument. Very important in, uh, in there. The forward contract that we signed with the counterparty would fix the price of the coal at a predetermined price. So uh, if we have a forward contract signed with the uh, third party, uh, with, with the counterparty, for example, I agree to buy or sell the, the coal at, let's say, $2,000. Uh, dollars per uh, in three months time of course in three months time when the contract expires we will need to exercise the contract and to buy and sell the coal at three thousand dollars in three months time now that would be a financial instrument another financial instrument we constantly use in practice is the futures contract okay now the full contract being signed over the next two years we still got two years, okay, by the field company, indicates the reduction in the price of a coal. So it seems that this would be a long-term contract. This will be a long-term contract. So usually, um, the company selling coals would certainly short the coal contract. So usually in a futures market, for example, but in the forward contract, we'll sign contract and to sell the amount of coal at the predetermined price at some point in the future. So it says the long-term contract triggers a reduction in price. And that would be the impairment indicator. So why would that happen? Well, there'll be a couple of reasons for that. So possibly change in the macro environment for example, the government came in, or perhaps the interest rate has been rising all the time. 
So, for example, if you look up in 2022, the Federal Reserve, which means the central bank in the USA, decided to put up its interest rate and therefore leading to a lot of commodity prices being reduced over time. And this will be one of the impairment indicators that we need to consider. And this is quite practical. If you don't have this knowledge, of course, uh, your answer, you can, of course, score the marks related to step number one is the general requirements in the IFIS. But application to the case and the conclusion may not obtain sufficient marks to pass this requirement. So therefore, it's very important that you study the SBR paper in a very, very practical manner. Now, let's see that. At 30th November, the mine has a useful remaining life of four years. Okay, the two years contract, the long term contract, would certainly be uh, implying the fact that the price of the coal may be reducing over time and therefore would be in the external impairment indicator. As a result of the decline in the price of the coal, the field decided to sell the mine. Okay, so what you need to do in determining the recoverable amount you need to particularly focusing on the fair value minus cost of disposal. And has approached several potential buyers. So in other words, you decide to sell the mine, but we are not particularly sure when would you sell it. So therefore, in conducting the impairment review tests, we still need to take the value in use calculation into account. So that's another point that you can save your answer. At 30th November 2006, at the year, in other words, the directors of field estimates there's a piece of mining equipment needs to be reconditioned for every two years. Estimating these costs will be two million and one million dollars for labor costs. So in other words, these are necessary cash flows in determining the value in use. As explained above, it is expected there will be future price reductions in selling prices of a piece of a coal, which will affect the forward contract being signed over the next two years. And therefore, it triggers, it leads to the external impairment indicator, in other words. Okay, four marks here. What I tend to do is the right four points related to that. So, I like to open up my uh, words document, the word file, because you'll be sitting the SBI exam uh, in a computer-based environment. So first of all, it's the company called Few, and we are answering the requirements part boy. First of all, I would like to lay out the general IFRS requirements, but here I'll substitute that with the heading the per IFRS impairment. I don't need to quote the specific number for that because the ice number 36, I don't need to say 36 because there will be no marks for these. I will tend to tell my students per the IFRS that will be absolutely fine. And then I'll bring the case application and then bringing my conclusion of where not, that will be the impairment indicator. Okay, correct that. There will be no correcting functions in the computer-based exam environment anyway. Okay, per the IFRS impairment, because there are four marks here, I will have to determine how many points I'm going to write. I will say to the students in the SBR, one mark per point in most circumstances. So make sure one mark per point in your paper. Per the IFRS impairment, I can say that the impairment review test should be carried out if the current value of the non-current asset is higher than its recoverable amount, first of all. And of course, I will further say the recoverable amount is determined by the higher of value in use and the fair value minus costs of disposal. So if you say this, yes, you can get one mark for this point. It's quite complete. 
and then I'll be applying to the case. That's very important. So first of all, there'll be a couple of things I can say to the examiner. First of all, the necessary cash flows to determine the value in use. So in other words, to determine the value in use, the necessary cash flows, including the uh, $1 million of the labor costs and the $2 million of part costs. So $2 million for parts costs and $1 million for the labor costs need to be included. At the same time, I can say to the examiner, the discount rate to determine the value in use can either be the incremental boiling rate or the WAC, okay, to be used in a VIU calculation. At the same time, I can also comment on that the company decided to sell the mine approached to several potential buyers. So the fair value minus cost of disposal may be more relevant in this case when determining the Recover uh, the fair value, uh, uh, the, the, the recoverable amount. Because the company, or I would say Philco, decided to sell the mine and has approached several potential buyers. So how many marks I've got there? One, one, possibly one, but I'm not particularly sure. But in the exam, there will be mark split between each of the requirement. Here, total at four marks, and therefore for the second part of the question, it would deem as one mark. And therefore, it will be three marks for the first requirement. And therefore, I don't need to write four points here because the maximum amount of marks I can get would be only three. And therefore, I would like to go through the conclusion for that. So this is an external impairment indicator because the long-term contract of the coal in a uh, long-term forward contract of the coal seems to decline in the longer period and this could be due to macro environment changes such as an increase in the interest rate so therefore it triggers which means it leads to the impairment review test to be done properly okay so that's all we need to understand here. So one mark for this for the conclusion part. Very important that you don't miss any questions in the exam. Now, if you have already covered the FM, for example, uh, uh, you may have come across the concept of basis. So that exists in a futures contract. Of course, a trade futures contract is well for commodities. And therefore, I know this. Okay, so for the basis for the futures, for example, we compare the spot price with the futures price, which means the price in the future, and that becomes the basis. And because nowadays, in this particular question, it says the futures price decrease, and therefore the basis would certainly increase. If basis certainly increase, uh, is quite abnormal in other words and that would be an impairment indicator because it suggests the fact that the asset at some point in the future is worth less than it should be currently uh, in the market. Hopefully you can get this idea 
As you can see, very, very important accounting standard. Now, before we move any further, let's see then. I've got some free of charge materials for you. OK, 那在我们呢，在呃开始另外一个准则之前呢，那么呃大家呢可以填写一下这个问卷网的一个连接，因为对于 SBR 的话呢，会有三份比较对于大家比较有用的一个总结，那么对于考试是很有帮助的。第一个是手写的笔记呢，比如说关于 IAS Number Thirty Six， 我对于这个国际会计的第三十六号资产的一个简直，那么所有的部分，那么都在里边。那么第二个呢是根据 I S W thirty eight， 也说无形资产。那无形资产的话呢，我有另外一个总结，在这个 page 那里。那么大家呢，呃，是可以获得这个笔记的。那么第三个呢，是我们今天的那个 notes。今天这个 notes 的话呢，那么一共有两个准则，一共是四十七页。那么里边呢，它和传统的教科书是完全不一样的。那么传统的教科书呢，在里边，呃，很可能是一些，呃呃，就是很小的一些例子。但是在我们这本书里边呢，我编写这本书里边呢，它是包含了非常多大量的实物的例子在上边。那么对这个 SBR 考试是非常有帮助的哈。那么，呃，大家如果呢要获取这些资料的话呢，可以到这个问卷网上填写你的资料呢。那么后续呢，在今天应该是在今天晚上呢，我会安排这个同事呢会把这个资料发到你们的邮箱那里。那么同时呢，呃，大家如果后续呢有这个 SBR 的一个问题的话呢，欢迎大家可以加我的微信哦。那我的微信呢 ，WeChat， 我的微信号呢是 Steve F C C A。那么在聊天窗口里边，大家都呃，如果呃觉得 OK 啊、呃，觉得有问题的话，都可以添加一下哈。OK， the next accounting standard that will be、uh, covering is the IAS number thirty eight intangible asset. So this is a very Famous and popular accounting standards that would be examined again and again by your examiner. Now, the intangible asset from the exam's point of view, first of all, you need to know the definition of the intangible asset. I'll summarize the key elements in the intangible asset into four stuff. First of all, you need to control the benefit. So, in other words, you've got laws and regulations. And to protect your ownership, and that's very important. So, for example,、uh, you bought a patent. You 买了一个专利 The law says the patent belongs to you. That's good. And if anyone, any third parties,、uh, using your product without your authorization, of course, they will be sued, and they will need to compensate for your losses because the law protects your interests. So here in this particular standard, it makes very clear the staff knowledge and training, as well as the customer loyalty, cannot be capitalized as intangible asset because you can't control the benefit because staff may leave the business. Second, to qualify the intangible asset, it needs to be identifiable. So in other words, if you buy the patent. Of course, it can be used by the business, and subsequently, it can be sold separately by the business without selling the entire business. So it can be separated from the business. That's what I mean by identifiable. At the same time, for example, alternatively, you may have a contract and to buy the patent. It arises from the contract. Of course, that's what I mean by identifiable. The third requirement is that it has no physical substance. So I wouldn't say it has no physical form because for the intangible asset, it's agreed in the contract. The contract is the piece of paper we've got a physical form because we can touch it. But it didn't have a physical substance because, according to the substance over form concept in the conceptual framework requirement, that in substance the intangible asset can't be touched. Okay. We can utilize the intangible benefit. Number four, it should be the non-monetary asset. So, for example, the account receivables, investments in debt instrument, investments in equity instrument can't be recognized as intangible asset. That's very important there. Now, for the intangible asset, nine out of ten in your exam question 
will be examining the cost model. So in other words, how much money that you spend in buying that intangible asset will be capitalizing that amount of money into the intangible asset at cost into the statement of financial position. For a cost model here, it includes three parts. First of all, if you buy the asset separately, recognize them at historical cost, the monies that you spend. Second, if you acquire the intangible asset as a result of a business combination, so in other words, you buy another business and you find out that its brand has separate value. And therefore, when buying that business, the brand would certainly become your intangible asset as well because you will engage an independent valuer in putting a value for that particular brand. And therefore, you will need to recognize the fair value at, uh, you will need to recognize that intangible asset at fair value rather than at historical cost. That's very important there. In the third case, rarely examined by the examiner, I, I usually tip the SBI exam questions. I quite often I saw the examiner questions Sometimes he will pick up an example from the IFAS practice guidance and sometimes he will use his imagination to uh, come up with a particular case for that. So sometimes the area hasn't been examined before, maybe the area that might be quite popular in the upcoming sitting exam. How about for government grant? So if the government decides to give you the intangible asset instead, for example, giving you the right to operate the radio station, giving you the right to operate the TV station. So what you need to do is to debit the intangible asset, but credit if there are conditions in there. So for example, you need to fulfill this, you need to fulfill that, you need to put them into deferred income liability. No conditions attached to a grant given by the government, you directly put that into the income. But remember, it's income, it's not your revenue. Okay, that's very important there. And of course, for the subsequent measurement, it really depends on the life of the intangible asset. If the life is finite, which means specifies the number of years that you can utilize that particular intangible asset, we need to amortize it according to the contract period. Alternatively, if you're not sure how long we can utilize the intangible asset. This is what I mean by indefinite use for life. Indefinite use for life, first of all, for certain categories of intangible asset, such as goodwill trademarks, trademarks, which means your logo, and perpetual franchise is right. For example, it's the right to operate Madonna. That would be an example of perpetual, which means permanent, which means forever, to operate that particular business. We will treat the use for life of that particular intangible asset as indefinite. So what we need to do, according to the conceptual framework requirements prudence concept, we need to conduct the impairment review tests according to the IAS number 36, impairment of asset. Very important uh, concept here. Of course, the final area is your FR stuff, is the R&D, research and development. I don't intend to cover that tonight. And of course, there will be a past exam question for the ICE number 38, and uh, you can check my notes if you submitted your information in the link. Okay, now, today we have already finished the SBR about the SBR. The SBR number 38. 大家可以在问卷网填写你的资料那么同时也可以加我的微信那么填写好资料之后呢我们今天晚上会把这个bonus的资料呢包括这两个手写的笔记了然后关于这两个准则结合着SBR的考试还有一些非常实物的东西呢
对，辛苦 Steve 呢。我们这边最后坚持的小伙伴真的不容易啊，因为今天其实呃 Steve 做两个科目连续两小时的一个直播，包括说从呃我们 AA 学习啊，梳理的一些 AA 所需要的一些基本的知识，还是说 SBR 刚刚提到的一些资产相关准则考察的一些说明。那么呃我们这一期的一个讲座其实接近尾声了，下一期会在春节假期后。呃，一月三十一号也是周二。那呃 ，Steve 可以先预告一下我们下一期的内容吗 y e s 那么也呃，下一期的话呢，我将会用呃这个普通话呃来去讲解关于咱们 s b l 考试里面非常 popular 的一个 standard， 是 i s 12 income taxes。呃，那么也在里边呢，特别是关于 deferred taxes 低点所得税的问题。那么同时呢，我会带过关于 i c e number thirty seven， 呃，也就是预计负债或有负债或有资产，在 S B R 里面怎么考察，而且我的手写笔记呢，那么还有我的单独的一个 note。嗯，好，谢谢 Steve。哎哎 ，OK OK， 收到。呃，那么同学们可以在呃，如果之前有报名的话，我们同时也会在开播前把这个。呃，第二期的活动的确认还会发送到大家的一个一个报名的邮箱。如果还没报名的话，大家也可以把这个活动的那个报名链接，我现在也可以呃 share 给大家一下的，请稍等哈。那么同时呢，我们在结束的那个最后，我们也会呃进行一轮的抽奖吧。那么名额也是两位。那现在开始，我们留十秒钟的时间好吗？好，请大家稍等哈。现在已经开始抽奖了，然后我们的时间呢就，好，五四三二一，好，那么恭喜 Sherry 跟杨磊这两位小伙伴，好，呃，我这边也把一个相对应要填写的一个表单发到呃那个。对话框里面，那么麻烦 Shelly 跟杨磊同学，恭喜你们，然后填写一下你们的一些个人的信息，然后我们的奖品呢，统一都会在本周五左右的时候寄出给到大家的，好吗？那么呃，谢谢 Steve 啊，然后后续的话呢，谢谢如果大家想和 Steve 继续有。呃，进一步的交流，或者是对于今天呃活动上的一些解题的 notes 啊，还有笔记啊，如果呃大家都想呃领取的话，可以通过 Steve 刚刚发送的问卷新的那个链接，大家去填写，好吗 ？OK， 那么最后呢，也提前祝大家呃那个农历新年快乐哈，呃大家都要好好的记住，就是我们呃不管你是三月考季是否有去报考，我觉得。呃 ，A C C 学习呢，肯定是会在你未来，就是你的人生投入产出比里面最高的一笔投资吧。所以也希望 A C C 的呃一些学员支持的一些服务能够帮助到大家。那今天晚上也辛苦 Steve 呢，因为接下来我们还有两期的活动。那么呃，我们接下来呢，希望说大家如果有任何的建议啊，然后也可以提出来，包括呃。大家如果对本讲座的内容上有建议的，或者是说你们想以后 A C C 举办更多的一些活动，也欢迎跟我们 A C C 联系，好吗？好，谢谢 Steve， 谢谢，谢谢各位同学，谢谢大家，谢谢快乐。OK OK， 好，那我们就今天先这样哈，到时候我们过两周之后再见喽，拜拜，拜拜，拜拜。